welcome to week three of August Heat. And uh, I'm Nick Ravellis, recently retired director of community engagement, uh, as well as the principal speaker for San Diego Opera. And I'm delighted to be invited back to share a few ideas about Verismo, which was a style of opera that appeared in the late 19th century. I can date it actually to the appearance of the opera Cavalleria Rusticana by Mascagni, which appeared in 1890. Followed the year after that in 1891 with uh, Pagliacci, or Clowns, by Ruggiero Leoncavallo. Two years later, 1893, Puccini had his first big hit, and that was Manon Lescaut. Followed two years after that, 1895, with La Boheme, uh, and then in 1900, Tosca, and then the rest is history. But I think it's interesting, particularly today, to note that Verdi's opera, Falstaff, Verdi's last opera, premiered within five days of Puccini's Manon Lesco. So Verdi's coming to the very end of his career. Puccini is beginning his career in 1893 within five days of each other. So just so you've got that in the back of your mind, I'll try and remind you as we're going through, because I think the chronology of the premieres of these operas is kind of interesting. Um, uh, just to sum up what we've done in the last two weeks, we talked about the vast difference between the world of bel canto opera, that is the operas of Rossini, Bellini, and um, Donizetti, and Verismo opera, which appears in 1890. And that was a reaction to the incredible popularity of the 1875 appearance of Carmen by Bizet, which of course had all sorts of scandalous things happening on stage, including an onstage murder, uh, women fighting each other with daggers in the tobacco factory, very passionate, almost, you know, not just romantic, but passionate body love between the two characters, Carmen and Don Jose, and all of that portrayed in the, uh, in the music uh, in, a, in a very direct way. This was incredibly influential on the first Verismo composers, and so they were taking their cue from uh, Bizet. Uh, the, the composers we were dealing with, were, and, and I introduced you to, were Mascagni, Leon Cavallo, Giordano, Cilea, and Puccini, but there's still a big question mark about Puccini, whether he is actually a Verismo composer or not. And we're going to sort of try to answer that today. Um, the stories came from com uh, uh, authors like uh, Emile Zola in France and authors like Giovanni Verga in Sicily, who was the author of the story, Cavalleria Rusticana. And these stories uh, were not like the stories of opera prior to this, the stories that dealt with mythical characters and noble characters, um, historical characters. No, 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 no more. Uh, composers like Mascagni and Lane Cavallo wanted to deal with the problems of real people. And to them, that mean, meant everybody who wasn't in their class, because they were middle class or upper class, real people meant the people who lived in the villages and were the lowest of, of cast of society. And so these were the folks that lived in the villages, peasants that lived in smaller towns and smaller cities, uh, and uh, according to Verga and other authors and the librettists of these operas, these were people whose passions were at the top, uh, who loved greatly and deeply. There was violence surrounding them. Sex was uh, something that you could deal with in these stories. And it really kind of let loose on opera in many, many different ways. These stories demanded a different approach musically. So the orchestras got larger. Once uh, Italian composers were aware of what Wagner was doing across the Alps with his orchestra, not only making it larger, but using more unusual instruments, the Italian composers followed suits, uh, followed suit, but, but using their own inimitable style. Of course, with larger orchestras in the pit, the, the, the singers, the, the quality of the, the vocalism had to be bigger. And so the spinto uh, tenor and the spinto soprano appeared. These uh, 
uh, spinto meaning pushed, so that the voice pushes just enough to be heard over that large orchestra. And we heard examples and saw examples of those kinds of voices. Uh, also, we talked about um, violent vocal outbursts and the, the, the way that composers are painting um, these, these violent emotions uh, in, in their music. Uh, last week, Bruce had uh, the guest, Katura Stikan, who is a stage director and is going to be staging our La Boheme, uh, talking about how to deal with intimacy. Of course, La Boheme, particularly Act One, deals with some very intimate moments. How do you deal with intimacy when all of the singers on stage have to be protected by 140 square feet of space on stage, right? And so she dealt with that beautifully. And I thought one of the most interesting things that was said was that we may be going back to an era in opera where gestures were larger. Uh, think, of, um, think of how movies were different in the silent era because we couldn't hear their voices. Gestures had to be bigger. Uh, in an era of pandemic uh, social, distancing, social distancing, there may have to be ways of dealing with physical intimacy in a completely different way rather than actually having characters hug, kiss, or hold hands and be close to each other. So lots of interesting problems. One of the other things that I thought was really fascinating is that when we come to Puccini, he is so detailed about exactly what he wants in his operas. Every, detailed is, every, every detail of the story is lined out through the music. There's no question about what it is that Puccini wants. So a stage director doesn't have to be um, tied down so much, but I mean, there is a certain amount of freedom within those details, but um, uh, so it's not a straitjacket. But the, but the stage director has to look very carefully about what's on the score, uh, what, what it is that, that Buccini is saying in the music. And Bruce gave that wonderful example of where uh, Rodolfo and Mimi meet, and she faints. We hear the fainting very clearly in the music. We hear him revive her with water, splashing a little water, droplets of water in her face, and that's perfectly uh, given to us in the music through the harp and she awakes, the music rises up as she gets up. I mean, it's that detailed. It is that detailed, and it's really quite wonderful uh, the way Puccini deals with it. So those are some of the things that we've dealt with. Now, I'm gonna continue by finishing up some of the musical hallmarks of the Verismo style, and then I'll move on to the question, was Puccini a Verismo composer? How was he influenced or not influenced? by Verismo. And I began by talking about the definition of Verismo that we have from um, one of our major sources, that's the Grove Dictionary of Opera. Uh, and one of, the, one of the hallmarks of Verismo is a directness of melodic and orchestral effect. And I think that we don't, look, we don't need to look any further than the opening of three of the operas that are influenced by Verismo. First of all, La Boheme, secondly, Pagliacci, and thirdly, Tosca. Uh, I say La Boheme because uh, Puccini brings the audience into the middle of a conversation. Marcello, the painter, and Rodolfo, the poet, are in the middle of, of their craft, practicing their craft, and they're in the middle of conversation. And we get into that conversation right away. Here is a video of the opening of La Boheme. Marcello begins to sing about how difficult it is to, to paint this gigantic painting that he's doing of the Red Sea, of the Egypt, of, of, excuse me, of the Hebrews crossing the Red Sea. Um, and, you know, what's more direct than very active music 
it tells us exactly who these characters are, where we are, and then the conversation begins. And it's no more than 30 seconds of, of music. Very direct. Here is the opening, or the prologue, of Pagliacci by Ruggiero Leoncavallo, one of the two original Verismo operas. And again, just from the character of the music, we know we're entering a very special place. Uh, we know that uh, the character that they're going to, going to first meet uh, is a clown from this group of clowns that are going from village to village playing their, their Commedia dell'arte play. So let's listen to the, be the very beginning of Pagliacci. the entire story. So it just begins with a bang. There's no prelude, there's no overture, there's no soft strings, you know, putting us in some kind of magical place. No, no, no. We're going right to the story, right into the middle of the action. It's wonderful. Uh, another perfect example of that is the opening of Tosca. Comes along in, in the year 1900 is when Tosca premiered. Now, I believe that this is the most verismic opera that uh, Puccini wrote, uh, and that's not because the characters are all peasants. On the contrary, the, the characters are all upper class or noble cl class in the, in, in, the, uh, in the case of Baron Scarpia. But it's uh, a direct communication to the audience because the first music that we get is the music that will be attached to the evil villain Baron Scarpia. Then the curtain goes up, we're in the, in, in the church of Sant'Andrea della Valle, and we see this character run into the church looking for sanctuary. He's an escaped convict. What could be more active? What could be more direct? And, and throwing us uh, into, the, into the middle of the problem of the plot than the opening of Tosca. Here we go. So it's rather like the beginning of a movie, isn't it? Uh, you know, we, we, we've gone immediately into the problem. Here's an escaped convict looking for sanctuary in the chapel, you know, trying to escape from the police and looking around. Uh, most productions, I think the character is a lot more active <laughs> trying to get away. This character seemed almost at repose. Because, but the music doesn't tell us that, does it? The music tells us that he's, you know, looking for a place to hide. He's desperate. He's uh, wanting to escape. Uh, wonderful way of opening an opera with a bang. Now, one of the other hallmarks of Verismo is the use of soundscapes. This is what the Grove Dictionary uses. Uh, soundscapes, which depict life as we encounter it uh, every day. So I can't point to any better example of that than the openings of either Act 2 or Act 3 of La Boheme. The opening of Act 3, we're in the snow, uh, we're at uh, one of the gates to the city of Paris. We know immediately kind of what time it is, it's dawn. Uh, how cold it is, it's cold because it's winter and there's snow everywhere. Um, and it's sort of open and airy, and the music, the music tells us all that. But here's an even more um, obvious example, and that's the opening of Act Two of La Boheme. 
And I would suggest that you close your eyes rather than watch this. If you don't remember how Act Two opens, it's at the Café Malmus, it's Christmas Eve, there are crowds of people shopping, eating in the café, moving around and milling about, and Puccini paints a perfect picture of what that must be actually like. Let's watch this. <laughs> Christmas Eve at Macy's in New York, right? Lots of people, lots of, you know, uh, color, lots of different sounds, all sort of piled on top of themselves. Puccini is so good at this, at setting what I like to call a sonic environment for uh, an opera, whatever that opera happens to be. Here's another wonderful example from our season. This is the opening of Suor Angelica. Now, it's, I think it's kind of interesting to know that Puccini's older sister was the mother superior in a convent. And so he would often visit the monastery when he was involved in writing Suor Angelica just to get a feel for what life was like in a convent with the nuns living in community, praying together, eating together, having their recreation together, having deliveries brought by cart from the village, having a connection with the village so that they had things to eat and you know they would trade the things that they made or that they grew with the villagers. And, 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 and Puccini just gets it right. I think this is probably the most picturesque of all of the openings of Puccini's operas and it is one of the great hallmarks of Verismo. This is a little longer, it's about three and a half minutes um, and uh, you'll hear a brief orchestral prelude that begins with a bell donging like right so the typical ringing of a bell coming from the tower of their chapel in the convent and then the strings enter very very quietly and we get the feeling that it's morning um, and actually there's a series of three consecutive days, I believe it's during the summer, um, when the, the, the beams of light, the rays of light, hit the fountain at the center of the cloister just right, and they disperse this golden light throughout the cloister. Now, the nuns talk about this later on in the opera, and, and, and Puccini tries to capture that character perfectly. Uh, hopefully this uh, performance will give you a good idea of what it's like. This is a perfect sonic environment for a late 17th century interior of a convent. Here we go.
Okay. Um, another example from our season, Johnny Skiki. And this is one other uh, hallmark of Verismo opera, and that is these composers want opera to be more like a stage play in terms of the unfolding of the plot. They want things to happen on stage as if they're happening in real time. And there is no better example than Gianni Schicchi. Even Suor Angelica that we just saw the prelude of takes its time a little bit to get into things. But Gianni Schicchi begins immediately with the problem at hand. We see Buozo has died and he's lying in his bed and his family is surrounding him and his family are mourning him and it's it's very very funny how the librettist and Puccini deal with his, the, the family mourning and how long they're going to mourn forever and one says oh I could mourn for days and the next one tries to top that says oh I'll mourn for a month oh no no I'll mourn for years and another pipes in and says oh no I'm gonna mourn Bozo, our dear Bozo, for the rest of my life, right? But then, very soon, we discover the problem. Uh, gossip from the city of Sinia has arrived. It seems that Bozo has not left his estate to uh, La Familia, to his family, who were there mourning him. Uh, he's going to leave them to the monks, the local monks, and of course that sets everything off. That is the essential problem. And all of this happens in about three and a half minutes. Let's watch the opening of Jenny's Kiki. Se posso prendere, prendi e vanno, ti 
very much like a stage play, uh, which I, is, is just brilliant and a wonderful way of, of um, enlivening the art of opera. Uh, I would dare say that it takes 10 to 15 minutes for us to get to the point with Bellini's Norma and to, 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 to discover and meet the, the main character and find out what she's about and what's going on. It takes a lot of time. But with these operas, the Verismo operas and particularly the operas of Puccini, much more like a stage play. All right. Now, I want to address, uh, because Wagner was active until his death, uh, obviously, in 1888, I believe, um, and you had to either love or hate Wagner. You could not be in between. But every composer who wrote opera after Wagner was influenced by Wagner, whether they liked it or not. They had to be influenced by Wagner. Even the Italians, who would say to your face, oh, we hate and despise, oh, Dio. You know, we don't have anything to do with Wagner. But Wagner's techniques seep into uh, the texture of the operas of the Verismo composers and Puccini, especially the opera La Boheme. Um, so what is the main thing? that they steal. And that, that is the, the, the use of the light motif or leading motive. The light motif or leading motive in Wagner is a musical idea, usually short or very simple, that is attached to a person or character or a thing, an object, uh, or an emotion uh, in, in these stories that unfold. And he perfected it in that 17-hour tetralogy the Ring of the Nibelung, which told the story of these gods and goddesses and their dealings with the underworld and with humanity. Uh, these three levels of uh, existence, uh, uh, all based on Teutonic and Scandinavian mythology. Uh, to give you an example, here is the motif or light motif that accompanies Wotan when he's carrying his spear. Wotan's spear is a symbol of his authority. It's a symbol of his power. It's also a symbol of the contract that he made with Fasolt and Fafner, the two giants that he tricked into building the palace of Valhalla, the castle of Valhalla. Now, as most of Wagner's leitmotifs are picturesque, they actually draw a picture of the thing or the person that they're meant to symbolize. So here is Wotan's spear in its most um, pristine form. Right? All it is is a downward, a descending scale, a descending minor scale played by the brass and the lower strings so that it has lots of power, frankly, and it's just a straight line down. It's a perfect, perfect metaphor for Wotan's spear. And then we get magic fire music as he strikes the spear on the rock where his disobedient daughter Brunhilde is going to sleep for the rest of eternity uh, and he calls upon Loga, the fire god, to start the fire. But he does it with his spear, and we get that magnificent light motif. Now, in Act 3, Scene 2 of Siegfried, the hero, Siegfried, confronts Wotan, dis disguised as the Wanderer. And in the family relationship, Wotan is actually the grandfather 
of Siegfried, but Siegfried doesn't know this. Wotan, of course, does. And he's disguised. He's got a patch over his eye, and he's usually got a cloak on, but he's carrying the spear. Siegfried has no use for him whatsoever. whatsoever. He makes fun of the spear. He makes fun of the eye patch. He makes fun of the, the robe. And, and he takes his sword, Notum, and he swipes the spear, and the spear breaks apart, destroying Wotan's power. And Wotan just slinks off, and we never see him again for the rest of the ring. Listen to what happens to that powerful motif at this moment in the destruction of Wotan's spear. do. It could not be simpler. He actually, he literally breaks the light motif up. He literally breaks Wotan's spear, the musical symbol for the spear, in a musical way. The old, original, pristine light motif just continues. <laughs> essentially what Wagner does throughout his operas when he's utilizing leitmotifs, the leitmotifs develop. They change. They vary. Every time a leitmotif appears, it's slightly different, or maybe greatly different, as in this case, uh, depending on the story, depending on the psychology of the characters at the moment, or depending on the feelings of the characters. Now, Italian opera had something like that, but it was not the leitmotif. Bellini uses it, uh, uh, Rossini uses it in the bel canto era, but in a very different way. Verdi most famously uses something like this in his opera Otello, which is dated 1883. Uh, it is the kiss theme, or bacio theme. At the end of the first act, Otello and his wife Desdemona have a little love duet, a love scene, and at the very end of it, Otello asks for a kiss. Un bacio, un bacio, ancora un bacio. A kiss, a kiss, one more kiss. And that's how the, the duet ends. And it's really quite lovely. Let's watch this. This is the original version of the Bacho theme from Otello. This, this bacho theme, or, or um, uh, as you saw in the Spanish subtitles, un beso. Um, now, at the end of the opera, Otello murders Desdemona by smothering her in her bed. Uh, she dies, and then he suddenly discovers that she was not unfaithful to him, that he's just murdered his wife and she was completely innocent of being unfaithful with Cassio. 
he grabs a dagger from one of his soldiers, stabs himself, falls at the feet of the bed of Desdemona, and looks up at her, and guess what happens? Let's watch it. Did the music change at all? Did it develop? Do this if you say yes. It did change. And give me a no <laughs> if you disagree. Uh, you know what? In the score, it is absolutely the same. There is no change whatsoever. What changes is what surrounds it. What changes is the story, what happens at this moment, what's very dramatic at this moment. That's the only thing that's changed is the, is, is the, the action on stage. In orchestration, key, tempo, in every possible way the music is exactly the same. So it's not a leitmotif. There's been no development, there's been no change, there's been no adjustment to that music whatsoever. So what did they call it? Well, I know what we call it. We call it thematic reminiscence. The remembering of a theme that was stated before in the opera. Thematic reminiscence. And uh, Verdi does it brilliantly. This is a wonderful, wonderful example of thematic reminiscence. And it did exist in Italian opera prior to Wagner. Wagner might have actually gotten the idea of a leitmotif from that. But then he got the more brilliant idea of actually varying the musical ideas as they appear in the score. And this is where Puccini is different from the Verismo composers. Verismo composers may use thematic reminiscence, but they don't use leitmotifs. And I want to show you, using the familiar music of Bohème, how Puccini varies these themes as we get them. Here's the opening of Bohème, right? And we're introduced to Marcello and Rodolfo, and by extension, the other two guys, Colina and Shonar, who all live together in this attic space. It's all in that opening music. <laughs> begins between Marcello and uh, Rodolfo. Now we'll hear it again in Act 3. Mimi is looking for Marcello and she asks one of the barmaids who's uh, outside of the, of the cafe, have you seen Marcello the painter? And the, the woman says, yes, I'll go inside and get him for you. And this is the music that we get. scenic painting with that that 
toll, the, the, the bell tolling in the background, and then that bohemian idea. Uh, so, but, but completely different from the way we have it at the beginning of the opera. What about Rodolfo? He's the second character in the opera who opens his mouth and begins to sing. Uh, and this is when he sings, when he opens his mouth. If I could find the page here, page four. It's a wonderful tune. and very much in the same quality as the music that opens the opera. But when he meets Mimi and introduces himself, we get a variant of that very same music. Right? In the aria, we get this. exactly the same music, but Puccini has put it in a different key, his favorite flat key, uh, and, and, and slowed it down and added luscious strings, uh, and it becomes something completely, completely different. So that's much more in line of a leitmotif. Here is the character Colina. You may not be aware of the fact that every character that enters in Act One gets his or her own music. So here is Colina, one of the other boys. Still very active, still very young kind of music. And here is the final of the four boys who live together in the attic, Shonar, the musician. probably the most interesting of these ideas, these melodic ideas, when she enters, you know, there's a knock on the door, uh, Rodolfo opens the door, and there she is, and this is the music that we get. strings. It's just so lush and gorgeous. And of course, in her aria, it is the music that accompanies her very first words. See? Mi chiama no Mimi. My name is Mimi. snow, in the cold, at dawn, at the entrance to the gates of, uh, of Paris, and um, every, all the activity stops. Now it sounds pretty much the same so far. Till here. Like a 
expecting, oh, what's next? What's, what's with Mimi? I mean, the music tells us that she's tense, she's anxious, she knows she's going to have to confront Rodolfo about breaking up with him. And then again, the last time we hear this motive is her entrance into Act 4. Musetta has discovered her collapsed in the street, brings her up to the attic, and uh, Musetta and Mimi enter to this music. is a perfect use of an Italian, a perfectly Italian tune, perfectly Italian music, but, but twisted at the end because tragedy is about to ensue. Something horrible is about to happen, and we can just tell from the way that Puccini takes Mimi's theme and twists it at the end, turns it, gives it a different accompaniment, puts it in a different key, gives it a slightly different tempo. It takes on a completely different character, yet we recognize it. Now, this is, this, this is one of the other glories of uh, Puccini, as far as I'm concerned. And that is, um, he's capable of creating within the ear of the audience member, of the listener, a kind of nostalgia, even though the opera may only be a couple of hours or maybe three hours long, when we're introduced to a theme early on in Act One, and then we hear it later in a completely different context, elongated, augmented, shortened, different instruments playing it, different tempo, but we still remember the tune and it produces in us a sense of nostalgia. Oh, that reminds me of something that happened earlier. Oh, um, I, re I remember that moment. Uh, and, and, and this might even happen unconsciously or subconsciously without us even realizing it. And it's, it's one of the brilliant techniques that Puccini uses to get us to cry at the end of every one of his operas. It is absolutely amazing. The use of a simple technique like this that he's borrowed from Wagner, but he's given his own inimitable Italian accent and Italian twist to give you that sense of remembrance, that sense of nostalgia. Puccini is better at that than any other composer. And because these operas have such tragic and sad stories, the nostalgia technique really makes an awful lot of sense. It, uh, it helps the audience, I think, become much more attuned and much more aware of what's going on in the story and how the relationships are built. So at the end of all that, and I've got, what, <laughs> six minutes left? Um, sorry, I would have broken earlier for um, questions, but I had to get done today. Was Puccini a Verismo composer? No. I don't think so personally. Uh, I think it's a, a misnomer to call him a Verismo composer, even though he uses a lot of the modern techniques that Verismo composers used first, particularly in Cavalleria, Rusticana, and Pagliacci. Those two operas were so influential. I mean, right up there with Carmen, 15 years earlier, uh, that, that no composer could ignore the impact, the story impact, and the musical impact of those two brief one-act operas. And Puccini, like everybody else, was influenced by them. And so he used all of those ha hallmarks of, of Verismo that define Verismo. The larger orchestra, use of different orchestral colors, directness, of musical um, affect, uh, vocal outbursts, passion, sex, violence, it's all in there. 
uh, but he just uses it in a very different way and overlays on top of it a kind of a brilliant Italian approach to the light motif. Now, to be absolutely fair and honest with you, uh, uh, Puccini uses the light motif more in Bohème than in any of his other operas. You won't hear them as much in Gianni Schicchi or in Suor Angelica, although he does indeed use them. But he's, his use of the light motif uh, technique is much more subtle in those two one-act operas. Uh, we have an audience uh, 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 question here. Was the audience at the time more able to feel this nostalgia than other ones? No, but I do think the Italian audience is different. <laughs> I do think the Italian audience listens to opera and goes to opera with their heart on their sleeves, right? And so they're, I think they're much more attuned to being manipulated, and it is musical manipulation. They're much more open to being manipulated this way than, I think, American or British audiences. Um, yeah, and I would agree with William. Uh, of the three trittico operas, uh, Gianni Schicchi, Suor Angelica, and Il Tabaro, Tabaro is the most verismo opera that Verdi, or excuse me, that Puccini ever wrote. Um, it, this actually does deal with uh, low-life characters, uh, passion, sex, violence. I would even call it a horror story. It's very much a horror story. The end, if it's produced well, is absolutely shocking. Uh, if it were made into um, a, a, a brief horror story as part of a, an anthology, you know, these various anthologies of horror films, short, shorter horror films, you might see four or five of them within the context of a, an hour and a half, La Uplande, which is the original story of Tabaro or the story of Il Tabaro, would fit in perfectly, absolutely perfectly. It is, an, it, it is truly a horror story. Uh, anything else? Somebody says it's very guy music. Barbara, yeah, thank you for that comment. You're absolutely right. <laughs> this is very guy music. Um, yeah, <laughs> I won't go any further than that, but yeah, it's... Uh, all of these operas, particularly the operas in terms of a look at romance, uh, it's, it's, through, it's through the guise of uh, uh, a heterosexual male. Very much so. Very much so. All right. Any other comments or questions before we bring it to a close? I've had so much fun doing this. Thank you so much. I appreciate Oh, I appreciate your Zoom uh, <laughs> twinkles. Thank you. <laughs> You're great. Uh, again, I remind you to check the chat board um, for Donate2. Uh, we're looking for small donations, so it would be great if you would be willing to do that. We say small donations because when you use the app Donate2, it does require a small fee, and we don't want you to be feed to death. So um, if, you, if you feel like sending us something, uh, please do, and I thank you in advance for that. I thank you all for your attention. Uh, this has been rather successful, I think, on both sides, from my end and from the other. We're also going to try to figure out the sound situation from the uh, San Diego Opera sound booth and try to get better sound in some of these clips. It's a little discouraging when you know, we try to... Uh, we really go to great lengths to put these, these clips together, but then when we play them and the sound isn't very good, and it might be the source. Our source is YouTube, and you know the sound is not all that good often on YouTube. So we'll try and improve that. Uh, and again, we look forward to seeing you uh, one more time in the future, the very near future. And let us know if you need the first video, call Patron Services, or very quickly put your email in the chat. Okay, and the chat will be where you find the app Donate2. Again, thank you very much. Have a great summer. See you all soon. Bye.